Uh, I'm going to pray a blessing over them. I would like you to stretch your hands out as we bless them. Father, we thank you for our children. We thank you, Father, that your hand is on them. <coughs> Father, they live in homes where your name is confessed and professed. I thank you, Father, that each and every one of them you hold as dear to yourself. That, Father, your son went to the cross for them. And, Father, your son rose. I am asking, Father, that the seed that is planted this day be planted in good soil, that it would raise up and produce a crop 30, 60, or 100 fold. Father, I am asking that not one would be lost. That you in your infinite mercy would save each of these. We bless them, Father, that they might walk with you. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Scoot. <coughs> I didn't even know that was you. Three people tell me to speak about, to address things, and I only wrote down two. So if I forgot yours, please forgive me, uh, whether it was an announcement <clears throat> or a prayer request. Um, when we get there, please, if you would just speak up. Okay. Um, <coughs> each of you in your bulletin should have a white sheet of paper. If you do not have a white sheet of paper, please raise your hand so we can get you one. Everybody got it? I see two sheets for three people. Anybody else need one? All right. I have a task for you today. At the top of the sheet of paper, I want you to write pastor. Now we're going to spend a few minutes here. Um, I want you to write a job description of what a pastor, his responsibilities are. What is the uh, job requirements, if you will, of a pastor? These will be graded, just so you know. <laughs> Please put your name at the top. <laughs>
Okay, don't worry if you're not finished with it yet, that's okay. I want you to take this with you as you go, and throughout the week, as God, thinks, God brings these things to your memory, jot them down. Okay. I want you to have a, a clips note, if you will. You don't need to write a, a, a book, but just a bullet point, some ideas of what you see a pastor's responsibility uh, be. Okay? Um, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Numbers 18. Okay, so we've been talking about what's my role, what's your role, um, a while back when this started, I talked to you about um, being a part of the body, specifically the body here, but also uh, the church Catholic or the church universal. No, you're not, I'm not telling you a part of the Catholic church. I'm telling you that Catholic being universal, we're part of that church, okay? Um, that we have been knitted into the body. Each of us has a, a particular call uh, that God has equipped us for. Um, we talked about love being that which binds us together. Uh, we took a look at uh, last week about the, the, the assembling of the priests uh, when God called Israel. Uh, he took them out of Egypt. He declared that they were going to be a, a nation of priests. Well, then a little bit later, we find that uh, God took the house of Levi, the tribe of Levi, and specifically the house of Aaron to be the priests. But the Levites also were going to have a role in uh, helping the priests accomplish what needed to be accomplished. Um, so today, we're, we're going to make just a couple of points. Um, if you don't give me any googly eyes, we might get out early. You can all laugh, that's fine. Okay, so, uh, verse 1. So the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear iniquity connected with your priesthood. And with you bring your brothers also, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may join you and minister to you while you and your sons with you are before the tent of the testimony. <clears throat> they shall keep a guard over you and over the whole tent but shall not come near to the vessels of the sanctuary or to the altar lest they and you die they shall join you and keep guard over the tent of the meeting for all the service of the tent and no outsider shall come near you and you shall keep guard over the sanctuary and over the altar that there may never again be wrath on the people of Israel. And behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you, given to the Lord to do the service of the tent of meeting. And you and your sons shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar and that is within the veil, and you shall serve. I give you priesthood as a gift and any outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Now, uh, <clears throat> I, I have to confess something. Um, some of the stuff in the Torah 
is very difficult for me to read, um, especially numbers, because the names go on and on and on and on, and I can't figure out how they're supposed to be pronounced. And so I, I typically come to names, and my brain just goes. Ee! Okay, um, I have been working on that because everything in Scripture is there for a purpose, and. You know, we're, we're kind of the oddballs in America because we don't really give a lot of thought to the name that we give our child as it relates to their character or nature. Okay. Um, names are very powerful things. You look at the names that, that uh, people that were in, uh, well, throughout all of Scripture, their names were significant. And we, we just, you know, to me, um, I grew up in a, a school that was a, a pretty large percent was Hispanic. And um, one of the guys, actually a guy that was at my church, his name was Salvador, <coughs> which means Savior. And his brother was Jesus. And so they went to a, a, a predominantly Hispanic church when they were young, he and his brother, and they would keep track of how often the pastor used one or the other's name. Because, you know, being Savior or being Jesus, oh, that's one for me. Um, why, I mean, why don't we name our kids Jesus? Anybody? Has anybody considered naming one of your children or previously considered naming one of your children Jesus? We consider disrespectful. Absolutely. But, how many people have named your children Joshua? Well, mm -hmm. well I'm, this is not, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone. I'm trying to show you these, these weird lines that we kind of make in things. Well, we consider that would be like naming our child God. Mm -hmm. And that could be problematic. Yeah, well, <laughs> Yahshua, <laughs> you know, um, Joshua. Sorry. I was almost getting the rhythm. <laughs> um, I got to think back past the music. Yeah, I am so sorry. That's okay. That's right. I got really upset one time because somebody's buzzer went off, only to find out later it was mine. <laughs> um, in Scripture, names have very specific purposes. Um, you know. <clears throat> Each of us had a method for picking the names of our children. Um, I don't really know how it came to pass, uh, but each of our children, uh, their first name has three syllables and their second name has one. Why? I don't know. That was, a, you know, it started on accident. Um, Donovan was not going to be Donovan. He was going to be Michael, and that would have ruined any chance of the, that progression. Uh, I was actually sitting in the waiting room. Um, Christy was getting set up in the labor and delivery room, and uh, there was a, a, a show on, and I don't remember which one it was, but it was a soap opera. And the guy and the gal were talking, and the guy's name was Donna. Well, I'd been struggling with wanting to name him Michael. Because I had two Michaels in our family, one on Christie's side and one on my side, and I didn't much care for either of them. Um, so when when she was ready and I got to go back in the room, I asked her, you know, how how uh, how fixed are you on naming him Michael? Now Donovan was born in January. Uh, we actually had a stocking for him that said Michael. Um, you know, if that's as far as she was fixed, was on that stocking, I'll get her a new stocking. Uh, but we started talking about it, and kind of, uh, at one point, her sister had commented, oh, you're naming him after Mike. And that's kind of what drove the nail through the heart of that name. And uh, she said, you know, I'm not particular. I said, well, what would you think about Donovan? And uh, his, his middle name uh, was named for my father. Uh, so it's going to be Michael Paul, which sounded very Catholic. Um, but he, we chose the name Donovan Paul. 
and that's where the, the whole three, three syllables, one syllable came into being. We had a very good way of deciding uh, how that was going to work. Um, Christy put all the names that she liked on a paper, and I crossed off all the ones I hated. <laughs> Uh, we had both had a list of names that we were going to name our children when we got married. Uh, uh, sad to say that not one of my names made the cut. Um, but it balanced out because none of Christie's did either. Um, so names. In America, we don't tend to choose the name based on what the name represents. Now, each of our children, their name does represent something. But that's not why I named them that, okay? Uh, I was not even aware until about 16 years into our marriage that Christy thought that we named Christopher because she was Christy. I just named her Christopher because I thought that was a good name. So, uh, so here, here we're going. In this, in this passage, God is speaking to Aaron, and he is reiterating, he's declaring that Aaron and his children will be the priesthood, okay? We find out later that, that Aaron is, uh, fulfills the role of high priest. When you think about that for a moment, that is an amazing grace that God would choose him. Because you gotta remember the story of Aaron. Now, um, gold went in the fire, calves came out of the fire. I don't know, that was Aaron, okay? you, you got to wonder, I think that's proof of how humble Moses was. You know, it says that he was the most hum humble man ever. And he comes down off the mountain and he sees them celebrating and, and bowing down to these calves. And, you know, what's going on here? And everybody turns and points at Aaron. And Aaron's like, I don't know. They gave me stuff. I put it in the fire. Calves came out. So we, we see that right there. Um, if, if you are ever doubtful of your usability, specifically as relates to your past, your struggles, take comfort. Because if God would choose Aaron out of all the children of Israel, if he would choose Aaron, who screwed up not just with the golden calves, but he and Miriam, remember that whole incident where, you know, who said you're boss? We do everything that you do. Um, personally, I get the picture that Aaron was a pushover. He was a people pleaser. You know, uh, unfortunately, he was Moses' mouth. When Moses came to Egypt, God said, I'm going to give you uh, someone to speak for you because Moses stuttered, uh, was not comfortable talking. And so Aaron was given to relay everything that God gave to Moses was given from Moses to Aaron, and then Aaron would speak it out to the people. Okay? Um, so Aaron is chosen, and, and just if you want another character to look at, you know, look at David. Not just David, look at Bathsheba. Okay? If you don't know the story of David and Bathsheba, talk to me afterwards, because it's an incredible story. Uh, God took that sin. And it's, quite honestly, it's one of the most disgusting things in Scripture. But God took that and he brought out of it the greatest king that would ever live. At the start of his ministry, at the start of his kingdom. But it was through Solomon that the lineage of, of one of the lineages came down through Jesus. So the other one was, uh, was Nathan, correct? Nathan, yes. Nathan, okay. Okay, so, Aaron is pulled to the side. He is going to be anointed and cleansed, and then he is going to be the high priest. His sons and the, the ones that follow after of his house will be priests following him. God has established them. Um, as we go through here, we see that the, the, the priests have the responsibility uh, for, in effect, the spiritual well-being of the people of Israel. Okay? They're the ones that will make intercession. They're the ones that will take the animal 
and sacrificed the animal and, and put it on the bronze uh, altar and, and they will take care of the actual intercession. The high priest will, will make intercession for himself and his family and once that's done, he will then go into the Holy of Holies and make intercession for all the people. Okay? Everybody in Israel. Um, that's the priesthood. Now we come to the Levites. Those that are considered brothers. Um, interestingly enough, um, how many kids did Moses have? Dos. Two. And neither one of them, and neither was Moses, were called to be priests. They were called to be the helpers of the priests. Okay? The Levites. God chose the nation of Levi to assist with the, the practical matters of, at that point, the tabernacle and later the temple. Now, I mentioned this briefly last week. Um, it's just one of those things that always speaks to me when I read in Scripture. Um, because of what God had done in Egypt, at least the way it reads, because of what God had done in Egypt with the firstborn, God always requires the firstborn of Israel to be given to him. Firstborn child, firstborn animal, doesn't matter. Firstborn belongs to God. Okay? When they counted up all the people, um, and they counted the number of firstborn, they took that number and they, they set it here, and then they took the number of the Levites, 20 years and older, um, and they put it here. And the, the difference, there was, there was actually uh, several hundred people difference between the two. And so Israel was required to pay the price for the insufficiency of, of the number of Levites. Okay? To me, that's just an amazing thing with how God's, work, God's mind works. Um, when God declares something to be so, and we look at it and we go, mm, probably not happening, certainly not with me. Um, God has this way of making things work. Um, remember the story of the widow and the oil? Get all the large, uh, oh, I can't remember the word, not containers, but the, uh, I'm sorry? Urns, that'll work. And bring them into the house and pour from your little bit of oil into each one of them. And all of them were filled to the top and there was a sufficiency left for their use. They sold the oil and they were able to get themselves out of the dire strait that they were in. Um, sometimes our lives are like that. Um, how many urns do you think God is filling in your life? As many as you collect. Yeah. As many as you, in faith, will gather. He will fill every one of them. Now, what's the size of your urns? I don't know why. Um, we have a, a cabinet in our kitchen that has about 80 flower vases. You open it up, and I don't know why they're there. Uh, every time we get flowers, we get a vase, and they all just go into this cabinet. One of these days, I'm going to invite all of you over to my house, and you're each going to take one base home, or two, or three. I don't know why that's the case, but what's the size of your base, of your urn? Is that sufficient? And what if I get ten of these? Would that be sufficient? See, this is, this is one of those cases where the supply will always exceed your ability to hold it. Because that's how God works. Now, let me qualify this. What goes into this is not necessarily what you want, mm -hmm. but it is most definitely what you need. Mm -hmm. Okay? And um, hmm, somebody didn't finish their news. <laughs> <laughs> So, the Levites, Levites are called out. They are going to be uh, looking after, ministering to the needs of the tent, 
Um, they are to take care of uh, the wood coming in. They're taking care of all of the, the things that need to be, getting the water to where it needs to be. Um, and then the priests are to give themselves over in service to the spiritual well-being of the people of Israel. Now, you think, okay, why are we going through this? Well, first, because it's interesting, uh, but then really because there is a corollary. Now, when we were in Israel, our guy, his name was Dror, and he had this thing that he said every so often that there is nothing in the Old Testament that doesn't have its duplicate in the New Testament. Okay? Um, and there are things in the Old Testament that are, are prophecies that are pointing to a particular time um, that did not come when Jesus came. So we look at those prophecies and we project into when he comes a second time. Um, but this is one of those things that so very clearly illustrates how God desires something to be done. If you would, um, flip over with me to Acts chapter 6. Okay, so the, the early church is being established the apostles, one of the greatest proofs for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the testimony of the apostles after they saw him. The eyewitness accounts. Uh, and, and there's something that we need to, to fully understand. Very rarely will anyone die for a lie. Okay? Very rarely will anyone die for a lie. But you had a large number, as a matter of fact, uh, 11 of the 12 um, apostles were, well, take Judas out, and they were martyred. Okay? They were killed because of their testimony. They kept their testimony even to the death. Okay? And you have all of these men, and, and then extending out from them, the first generation believers who are willing to put their lives on the line for what they know to be true. Okay? So they're establishing the church. Uh, just a side note for that as well. Um, it wasn't all roses. There, there were thorns. There were stumblings. There were mistakes. Because as great as God is, he's given us the ability to choose. And sometimes we choose wrongly. Okay? Sometimes we just goof up. So this is, is being established. And we get to uh, chapter 6. And there's almost like this, this parenthetical chapter that's just kind of stuck stuck in there. Again, nothing in Scripture is in there without purpose. Sometimes we don't comprehend the, the purpose, or sometimes we, we misinterpret the purpose, but everything in here is with a purpose. Keep her laughing. That's one of the greatest sounds that you will ever hear. Okay? Um, verse 1, chapter 6. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So basically what's going on here is the Hellenists or the Greeks, that's just a, a, a euphemism for those who are not Jews. Okay, So anybody that was not of the nation of Israel that came to faith, they're in this, this group, sometimes they're called the Greeks, sometimes the Hellenists. Um, they, they're complaining because they were being neglected. They were not receiving their share. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, real quick, keep that in your mind. The full number of disciples. There's more than just twelve disciples. There's only twelve apostles. Later we'll actually see a couple more that are called apostles. But there are disciples. Okay, um, The full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Keep that word in mind. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. 
Then they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, just as we saw the priests in the Old Testament were from the lineage of Aaron, but the Levites were given to the, the I don't want to say mundane because it's so much more important, that the, the practical matters of how things get done, the logistics, if you will. The Levites made sure that, that the, the oil was given to the priests. They made sure that the, the carcasses were taken off. They made sure that, that all of these things basically freed up the priests to do what the priests needed to do because the utmost significant thing in the priesthood was to make intercession, to make sacrifice, to represent God to the people and to represent the people to God. Okay? So the entire tribe of Levi, all the men were coming in and helping. And right here, we see the exact same thing happening. Okay? We see that the apostles, you know, the people are coming to them saying, hey, 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 we're hungry. We say, you know what? We appreciate that you're hungry, but man, this, this, we don't have time for this. God has commissioned us to do particular things. He's called us to preach the word. Now, what's the word at this point? What's that? Old Testament. Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible. Okay. When they're preaching, they're preaching out of the Old Testament. And they're saying how these things have been fulfilled. One of the greatest travesties in the church today, I believe, is that we have forsaken all of the promises and all of the things that God has set up and established in the Hebrew Bible. And we've sliced it out and set it to the side. And we just study and focus on the New Testament. That's like putting a house a roof on your house when you don't have walls. You can't fully appreciate the roof without having walls up that hold it up. Okay? So they're preaching uh, out of the word and, and their call, as we see a little bit further down, um, is to pray and to preach. So they're saying, hey, we need somebody. We need men of good repute. It's not just anyone. Choose for yourself these men and let them take care of the practical matters of the church. Okay? Now, that we see straight from Scripture. I'm going to wrap up on this. Um, I believe that is specifically the, the difference between a, an elder and a deacon. And we're going to look at this next week because we're going to dive into what the job description, what the requirements are for someone to be an elder or a deacon. And, you know, i got to let you guys know, a lot of churches out there make that a hierarchical thing where they say, um, you know, we have God and then Jesus and then the elders and then the deacons. I don't believe that. Okay? I believe the tasks are different. I don't believe that one is more important than the other. I mean, what, what really gives us any value? The blood of Christ. And if you have the blood of Christ, you have the ultimate value. Right? All right, so next week we're going to get into these things. Please continue working on uh, your um, What's My Job as Pastor. Uh, get into the Word, do a little digging. Uh, Dennis, you can't just resend me the thing. You have to write it out. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'll be different. Okay. I've heard difference is good. <coughs> Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you have given us your word, that it is sufficient. And Father, you give us your spirit to illuminate the word, to bring understanding. Father, your word tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. Because it's not writing on a paper. It is the divine looking down to the human. We thank you, Father, for entrusting us with your word. Amen.